Such a Elder Jun Lang. It's such a joy, such a privilege and honor to be here worshiping with all of us. And uh, we just want to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. And just like to greet Elder Wee. I believe that uh, you are getting better. We all have been praying. And also Sister Juliet together with the whole family, Ben, Matthew, and uh, Joy. And how many of us have actually uh, read through the book of Joshua? Uh, just when you started the whole series, you just started reading again. Anybody? Okay, uh, those who started reading again, this is a present for you. A gold, gold bar. Come. Yeah. You don't want to? Okay, don't want <laughs> Anybody else? Who just, okay, yeah, this brother here. Yeah, God bless you. This is to, uh, to encourage you. Anybody else? Anybody else here to... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, you can share it. It's okay. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Last week, we covered the topic on uh, don't forget to remember. How many of you have already forgotten? Yeah. It's not easy to remember certain things. And... Uh, I mean, to tell you honestly, oh, there's a feedback that you can hear me from there. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> so, I mean, I've come to terms as a pastor that not everybody will remember all the sermons. And really, it's like, sometimes we can't even remember what we had for lunch, right? So, <laughs> but the, the truth is that they'll remember the times that we spent together Praying, ministering, and having time in fellowshipping, right? And I thought the fourth W is whack. Whack is actually go and makan, you know, and let's whack the food. So I thought it was very important also. So anyway, and so we know that in chapter 1, we have the call and the commission that God has given to uh, Joshua. And then, of course, chapter 2 is a very important chapter. It talks about Rahab. Right? So the difficult one, we pass it to the elders to preach. So Rahab talks about grace. I mean, sometimes we have a lot of uh, tinted lenses and we have all kinds of judgmental spirit and say, oh, you mean this, this uh, prostitute is able to, to be uh, saved and, and things like that? I mean, God loves all regardless. Can you say amen to that? God loves every single one. And the Bible tells us who has got no sin, cast the first stone. Amen. So the Lord wants us to be embracing, to know that it's really the goodness and the grace of the Lord, which brings us to chapter 3, the crossing into Jordan. Right? So what are the three important keys that we need to remember for crossing into Jordan? One is the, the priest. What does it signify? It signifies prayer. And then the Levites signifies praise. And then the ark the ark represents the presence of the Lord. And in this ark is a, the, the whole representation of the Holy Trinity. Because what's inside the ark? Inside the ark, you have the, the rod, the budded, signifying the Holy Spirit. And then you have the pot of manna, the golden pot of manna, signifying Jesus, who is actually the bread of life. And also, we have the Ten Commandments, the two tablets, signifying God the Father. So when we go with the presence of the Lord, we are going with this Trinitarian formula, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that everywhere we go, that the presence of God is so important for all of us. And of course, uh, last week we talked about you know, the memorial stones, and we need to constantly remember, 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 remember the two things, what is, which is the greatness of God and the goodness of the Lord. Because whatever storm that we go through, we always remember that God is great and God is good. He's both great, He's both good. And He's both great and good, right? So, He's not one without the other. And we thank God that in whatever life situation, that we have the Lord seeing us through because He's a good God and He's a great God. He's able to set us free. He's able to deliver us out of all of life's situations. That wherever we go, that His presence will never leave us nor forsake us. And so this is something that we need to constantly remember. So in the battles of life, sometimes we are successful and sometimes we fail simply because 
there are some instructions that are very clearly listed, prescribed, commanded by the Lord, and we need to follow it exactly what the Lord has given to us. And we know that when we follow the words of the Lord, and we just like to look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is something which is uh, just, the Lord just dropped this into my spirit, and I just want to share this with all of us. Deuteronomy chapter 28, it talks about blessings and curses, right? Deuteronomy 28 reminds us that there's one particular prescription that God has given to us. He says in verse 1, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently, right? Listen to the word, diligently. That means you really take note, you really want to serve the Lord in fulfilling the word of God. Diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments, which I commanded you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings, say all these blessings, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. And he listed down the whole amount of blessings that God has given to us. Blessed shall you be in a city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed will be the fruit of your body and produce of your ground and the increase of your herds and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. And we see all the blessings of God coming into our lives. I mean, let's be honest. Who doesn't want blessing? We all require the blessing of God because we are all people in need and we need the blessings of the Almighty God. We need the favor of God. We need God's hand upon our lives. Yesterday, I was just preaching from uh, Nehemiah in my church. And one distinct feature we see in the life of Nehemiah is that we see this recurring over and over and over again that the hand of the Lord was with him. And also we see the same similar trait in the life of Daniel, that God's hand is constantly upon his life. And we have God's hand upon lives, it simply means that the favor of God will never leave us nor forsake us because God's favor will just come upon our lives and we can receive all the blessings that follows after it. And we just want to thank God for that. So the Lord's word is so clear. And when I first read this passage, I tell you, I was totally depressed. Why? Who on earth can fulfill all these? Diligently obey the voice of the Lord. Observe carefully all His commandments, which I commanded you today. I can't. Honestly, I can't. But there's one person who can. And His name is Jesus. There's one who could fulfill all the requirements of the law, and His name is Jesus. And the good news for all of us today is that we are, we are, all of us are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And because of Jesus, that we received all the inheritance that God has in store for you and for me. The riches of God's glory has come upon our lives because we have, been, we have received Jesus as our Lord. That we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And we just want to praise God for that. So as we see, today we're going to cover chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 of Joshua. It's a very ambitious uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, we try, lah. Okay. So we know in chapter 5, the first thing that was required of all of them going after crossing the river Jordan, the first thing that's required all of them to do is to go for circumcision. What kind of military strategies, strategy is that? I mean, going to the new promised land, the first thing, you go on MC. I mean, at least five days, you know, for an, uh, 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 an operation like this. Immediately, they have to be resting. And I believe that the Lord is reminding us that this is not just a physical battle in which they are fighting. This is a spiritual battle. And when you want to perform spiritual things, it's going to be done through spiritual means. Tell your neighbor spiritual means. Spiritual methods. Spiritual means to do all the things that are spiritual. And it's not just a physical battle when you are battling the Jer walls of Jericho. We know that this strong man, this stronghold has to be defeated. And we know that it only is it's only possible through the power of God. And therefore, they have to be totally consecrated. And they have to go through this whole thing called circumcision. Now, all the Jewish boys, the moment when they are born, on the eighth day, they're supposed to be circumcised. 
right? According to some medical science which I read, it says that actually the human body is very interesting, that the eighth day it produces so much uh, that kind of chemical that stops the bleeding. And on the eighth day, they went through circumcision so that this little boy won't have to bleed to death. And we know that God has ordained all this because God is all-knowing. Amen? And that's the beauty of knowing the Lord who is all-knowing because whatever situation we are going through, He understands. He knows what we are going through. And He can see us through and to help us and to provide for us for our every need. And not only that, eight is a very significant number. Eight actually represents a new beginning. So when these people went through circumcision, of course, all of them were not circumcised on the eighth day. They're all adults by now because they've gone through the wilderness and they were not circumcised in the wilderness. And the moment when they crossed through River Jordan, the Lord specifically told them, you guys have got to be circumcised. And this is actually recorded in Genesis chapter 17. And this tells us the whole significance of being circumcised as children of God or male children of God. We look in Genesis chapter 17 that God actually had a covenant with who? Abraham. Genesis chapter 17, reading from verse 23 and following. What does it say? When God entered into that covenant with Abraham, and verse 23 tells us, So Abraham took Ishmael his son, all who were born in this house and all who were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins, and at the very same day as God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael his son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his false skin. So we know that God entered into this covenant and the Lord is using this as a reminder for the children of Israel that the reason why they go through circumcision is because of the covenant that God has made with all of them. Remember the battle in which uh, David was fighting with Goliath? Remember that? And when he, con- when he actually confronted Goliath, what was the thing that he said? You uncircumcised Philistine. Why was he so particular about a certain anatomy of his enemy? The reason why he's saying that is because he's telling the enemy, you are not covenanted with God. But I, who is a son of God, I'm covenanted with the Lord. And the Lord is with me. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. And we know that God is for us who can be against us. We know that God is always on our side. He's watching over us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we praise God for that because God is always being with us. He is Emmanuel. I just want to thank God for this brother who was playing just now. I mean, I can just listen to him for hours and hours because there's such a flow of the Spirit. I just want to thank God for that. And incidentally, my granddaughter's name is also Emmanuel, but uh, with the L-L-E. Oh, for the female version, because we know that God is with us, that He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we know that today, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, the reason why I'm actually camping around here to, on this topic is because I feel it is something that is so important for all of us to remember. In verses 10 and 11, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he says, uh, in verse 11, "...in Him you were also circumcised." with the circumcision made with our hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, in which you also raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. And we praise God that all of us go through this whole sacrament called water baptism, signifying that we are dead with Christ, that we are buried the moment we get into the water, And the moment we will come out of the water, that we are resurrected with the Lord into a new life with the Lord Jesus Christ. So those of us who are not baptized, I really sincerely encourage you to go for your baptism, right? So we know that this is something very significant. I was baptized in the year 1979. Some of us were not even born yet, so anyway, you know how old I am. So 1979, December 25th, it was on a Christmas day. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, and on the 27th, I was drafted into the National Service. So, 
And so there was a, really a, a milestone in which I always remember. So when I went into BMT, I have this in mind that I'm a new person in Christ. I live for Jesus. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And I see a national service as my mission field. Which pastor could actually go in and preach them? Nobody! But those of us who are in national service, you're able to reach your friends, you're able to reach your campmates, and through the course of the two and a half years in national service, I actually brought a couple of them into the saving knowledge of Jesus. And I praise God for that, because it was a decision that I've made that I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. And there were many compromising situations, but I have to say no to them and say no because I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Jesus. And these are the things that I do not practice. Sorry. And of course, when, whenever they see me, they call me Amen, Amen. Because I, I hang out with a lot of, uh, uh, they call it uh, those so dialect soldiers, right? So, so they see me, oh, Amen, Lila, Amen, Lila. So, <laughs> okay, praise God. And anyway, and uh, so we know that when there is a circumcision, what takes place? A cutting takes place. And when a cutting takes place, there'll be blood, right? And what does blood signify? It signifies a covenant. That's why the prophets of Baal understand the power of blood. And they were actually slashing themselves so that blood could be oozing out from their backs because they have entered into the covenant with what they have believed in. And you and me, we have entered into a blood covenant and through the blood that was shed on Good Friday, on the day in which Jesus died for you and for me. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Because we know that Jesus... He's the ultimate sacrifice. He's the perfect sacrifice for you and for me. And we just want to praise God for that. That's why we take our virginity very seriously. Have you ever asked yourself, the first time that a woman actually enters into a sexual relationship, why is it blood? I mean, I ask questions like this. I mean, I ask God, hey, why, uh, why like that now? Nah? And the Lord told me because it is a blood covenant between the husband and the wife. Praise God. This is sealed in blood. So it's something that's very important for all of us. And we all know that we are all in a spiritual battle. The Bible tells us very, very clearly, we are not fighting against our bosses, neither our leaders or our elders. We are fighting against powers and principalities. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 and following, it says, Finally, my brethren. You know, each time when the Apostle Paul says finally, it's actually not finally because he is finally, then he continue, 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 continue. So it's like me sometimes I say, you know, the last point, but then after the last point, got three more sub points, and, and out of the three sub points, they've got six more sub sub points. <laughs> anyway. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the full armor, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this darkness of age, of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And where are all these found? In the heavenly places, right? Someone said that, you know, there are three realms. We have the third heaven to be with the Lord. The second heaven is actually, of course, the first heaven is where you see in space. You know, sometimes I re recommend some people, hey, you better be an astronaut. And he says, Pastor, why? I say, because you're always in space. <laughs> you're always spaced out. Anyway, so we, we know that the second heaven is where the spiritual realm is. And the Bible tells us in these heavenly places that there are, there are principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness. And this tells us that even in the spiritual realm, there are in a hierarchy. There are different levels. So we need to understand different levels, different devils. So we know that we need to understand how then we can battle all these devils and all these powers of darkness. And I, I used to teach this as a course in the Bible school, and it was like uh, four sessions kind of thing. So I'm trying to condense it within five minutes. So anyway, so we know that there are different levels, different hierarchies, and there are different strategies required to be employed in overcoming all these spiritual darkness. All of us have given the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the powers of enemy and nothing would harm us. And we know that there are many confrontations that we have with demons, 
because they are on this ground level. But when we move to a higher level, we have to devise a different strategy. Right? And the Lord will give us insight as to how we can overcome. And many a times, it's not just through the, the effort of one person. It requires the collective body, the body of Christ, that all of us can come together so that we can push back the frontiers of darkness. And praise be to God. God has given us the authority to overcome all these powers of darkness that we don't have to fear. And we know that even as we understand things like spiritual warfare, we're not trying to find out, is there a devil behind every tree? Is there a devil, devil behind every stone or whatever it is? But we know that God has given us the ability to overcome them, to identify and to help us to get rid of this. And many times we know that the best strategy that we can employ in overcoming the powers of darkness is one, repentance. And two, forgiveness. Because when we have repentance and forgiveness, this, this allowed the enemy to have a legal right over whatever that we are facing. That's why it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways. There's a whole lot of humility required, a whole lot of repentance required, a whole lot of forgiveness required. We need to ask God to forgive and we repent. And when we do that, we're going to see God's breakthrough coming upon us. And another thing that is so important is to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You know, many a times when, you're, when I'm ministering to people who are oppressed, and we know the manifestation of demons is happening, you tell them, say Jesus is Lord. They just can't say it. They cannot acknowledge Jesus, the Lordship of Jesus. And we know that the moment when they're able to do that, the breakthrough is there, and the Lord would begin to just work in that person's life. And so we know that in this story, the Lord has prescribed for all of us specific instructions. The instructions given are actually found in Joshua chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, and verses 24 and 25. Let's look at that, shall we? If you have a Bible, you can turn to uh, Joshua chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible, I will read for all of us so that all of us can follow. Verses 18 and 19, it says here, And you by all means abstain, in other words, don't ever have anything to do with that from the accursed things, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. You see, the Lord in His wisdom. We need all these precious metals because there are many battles ahead and the Lord requires all of these to be in the treasury so that all these could be used in the production of weapons for them to fight physically against all the Canaanite nations, the Gergeshites, the Hittites, the mosquito bites and termites and everything. So we need to overcome all these and they need the precious metals so that this will help them in developing all these weapons <clears throat> to overcome to overcome all the powers of the enemy. And so this has been already stated. It says, look very carefully. Really understand this. Abstain. Don't have anything to do with it. Don't even touch it you know, for yourself. It says, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become accursed. And not only that, you make the camp of Israel a curse. You see, it's a very clear and specific uh, commandment that God has actually said through Joshua to the whole nation. And say, don't touch any of these things. Don't keep any of these things. Don't kapo, you know, don't keep it for yourself. Because this will affect the whole nation of Israel. Be very, very careful. Listen carefully. This is something which you really need to take note. You know, take out your tablet and write it down. So we need to just understand that this is a very clear and specific instruction in which the Lord has given. The simple reason... It's because whatever God has prescribed for us, and we go against that, there'll be open doors in which the enemy can come in and affect us and to attack us. We don't want to have chinks in our armor. We don't have, want to have holes in our armor to, to allow these things to affect us in any way so that the enemy can come into our lives and, and cause all kinds of attacks and confusion and oppression and, and things like that. So, we need to be very careful. And so this happened at the Battle of Ai. 
we want to cover the failure, then we cover the success, right? So what, what caused them to fail in the battle of AI? In the battle of AI, simply because they actually took, someone took something from the enemy in Jericho and kept it for himself and his family and therefore brought about the whole curse of God upon the whole nation of Israel. We'll go into that more detail afterwards. So we know that there are open doors that we need to understand. If we constantly open ourselves to a habitual sin, and somehow we are not able to get rid of it, then I think we really need to have some help. We need to get some people to come with us, alongside us, to minister to us, so that this particular habitual sin that we've been repeating over and over and over and over again would be gotten rid from our lives. We need help. There are sins in our lives that, that become not just something that is a habitual sin because when we open ourselves to a particular sin, what's going to happen is that it becomes a beachhead. Beachhead is a military term. It's a strategy in which the enemy enters into a particular place and when there's an entry point, it goes in and subsequently this beachhead becomes a foothold. And from a foothold, it actually becomes a stronghold and from a stronghold, it deteriorates, become demonic oppression. So when a person is open to that, then it becomes all kinds, we get all kinds of problems. One of the very prevailing problems that we see in all over the world today, it reaps billions and billions and billions of dollars, is this problem called pornography. It always starts with a very innocent thing. Oh, I just want to see what's, what's it like. We just want to check it out. Or sometimes it could be a pop-up. And from there, we, we say, oh, just a curiosity. You know, we just want to take a look. And, and from there, when we open ourselves to that, I don't know why I'm saying this. If we open ourselves to that, I mean, this thing comes in because there are spiritual forces behind it. And so when we open ourselves to that, we begin to open ourselves or the doors to the spirit of lust and of course the spirit of fornication, the spirit of adultery, the spirit of whatever. All these things will come in in a whole barrage. And we don't deal with that, then we are into trouble. But let me just say this, behind all these, if someone is habitually into this problem, it's actually a symptom of something that is deeper within that person. Usually there's a spirit of rejection or this person has been abused or this person has actually uh, have this, they call it the orphan spirit or the uh, unloving spirit or whatever it is. And because of that, this unmanned, deep-seated emotional need that this person has to get into a situation where he can expose himself to all these uh, viewings. You see, because when a person actually views all these things, there's a stimulation and there's stimulation, there are chemicals in the brain that actually triggers. One of the chemicals being triggered in the brain is oxytocin. Paisa, in front of a doctor, I thought all this other stuff. Chemicals in the brain, it affects us because it brings pleasure. It's like having drugs. And so we get addicted to it and we want it more and more and more. We get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and we get into all kinds of problems. And then when we open ourselves so widely, we are actually inviting spiritual forces to come and affect us. So what happened at the battle of AI? Simply because there was an open door. The open door was because of Achan. Uh, in the Hebrew pronunciation is Achen. You need to have the guttural sound. It's like, you know, in the morning you clear your Achen, okay? But we call it, some call it Achan. So anyway, so it's uh, Achen. We call it Achen for now, right? So in chapter 1, verse, sorry, chapter 7, verse 1, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass. In other words, trespass, they're different, like I mentioned the other day, there are different types of uh, so called sin. You have Iniquities, you have trespasses, you have uh, sin, and sin is falling short. Trespass is whatever that's been stipulated and we went over, all right? You're trespassing into someone's territory. So we have trespassed the, the, the laws of the Lord. Regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Cami, 
the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. Now why? Very carefully, as you see this verse, the Lord knows not just who Achan is, but He knows his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, and the tribe that he's from. We can hide, but we know that God sees. God is the one who is the witness. He's able to tell and to see. So sometimes we dash through the traffic light. Oh, hang on, no camera. But somebody's watching you. <laughs> so we know that this is something that we need to take, take note. We don't want to trespass. Okay? So, so the very thing is that God wants to tell us that he knows that this is actually a historical record. It's not just folk story or folklore or fairy tale. Just pluck out a name or this name by the name of Achan and then this person committed sin and, and uh, this guy is doomed and stuff like that. No! The Lord specifically listed down the genealogy of Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, and from the tribe of Judah. So it's actually something that is very significant in which the Lord wants us to understand and so there was an open door. And we need to be very, very careful of open doors, right? Because there are open doors in the, in the life of uh, the children of Israel. Just click the next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. So what happened is, actually, you see in chapter 7, I like to commit all this to your reading, uh, so that uh, on the last day you can have some more gifts. So anyway, so we have pride and complacency, right? So we know that when they were sent to spy out the land, it says that in verse 3, they returned to Joshua and said, do not let all the people go up, but you know, let's let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack AI. Don't worry, you know, all the people there are for the people of Israel, are, are few, you know? So it's like, Hey, Joshua, cool it, man. We've just conquered Jericho. Oh, what's the big deal of AI? It's nothing. It's easy peasy, you know. We can just go in and trample on them. We're going to get the whole place and we're going to defeat them and we're going to just take over. Don't worry. I believe even as we are reading this, I just sense the, the element of pride within the, the camp of the children of Israel. Of course, I'm reading into it because you may say that hey, it's not written in the Bible, but with the attitude that we see behind all these people, there's pride and complacency. And of course, there is no record of the consultation with Yahweh. They've never asked God, Lord, what shall we do? You see, what is so significant about the life of David is that every single battle, the Bible tells us, he inquired of the Lord. In other words, he asked, Lord, should we go? Should we not? Should we, what should we do? And he always would inquire of the Lord and God would tell him specifically, yes, go. This is something that is going to, is, you're, going to aim, you're going to win this battle. Go, you know, this is something you're going to win this battle. Just go, just go, just go. And no, please, don't, don't go, you know. So the Lord gives specific instructions because we consult the Lord. And so the Bible is teaching us that whatever situation we are facing, whatever battle we are facing in life, we need to consult the Lord. We need to ask God, Lord, what shall we do? Don't try to be that smart aleck and be a smarty pants and to try to do things ourselves. Oh God, I'm so used to it, you know. And you know, every message that I prepare is with prayer and seeking the Lord. And to ask God, what are the things that I should share with this particular church? No two churches are the same. And so therefore, the application is different. The illustrations are different. The style is different. And everything is different. I cannot say, okay, I just take this out. You know, I've preached this several years ago. I follow the notes and I'm okay. No way. And I, I really am so blessed by all these sessions. I hope you are blessed as well. Can I tell you a trade secret? The one who benefits most is actually the preacher. Because we really spend time. Can you say amen to that? Yeah, so please go and preach, right? So please go and prepare and, pre and teach. And, because really, the person who benefits the most is the one who is preaching it. 
I have been so blessed by the Lord with all these insights and all this revelation and all this illumination and how the Lord has been speaking to me and applying it even to my own life because we all go through different spiritual battles because we're not fighting against flesh and blood, against powers and principalities and powers of wickedness and we know that we need the Lord's ability to overcome. Of course, the third thing is sin in a camp. We see this in chapter 7, verse 11. 7.11, right? So it's easy to remember. So he says, Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things which have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. Oh, it's just like the translation, oh, their own stuff. Cool, man. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before enemies until you take away the accursed things from among you. Right? So this is something that is so important for all of us because we know that sin has its consequences. The reason why I put this slide in stark red is for us to capture this as something that is so important for all of us to remember. Because if we open ourselves to the powers of darkness, then definitely we'll face the consequences because sin has its consequences. Because they were willfully disobedient to the Lord. The Lord has already mentioned it. Take note. Be very careful. Be I mean, you really have to take notice of this. But there was willful disobedience. It's not something which is done out of ignorance. You know, sorry, Lord, I don't really know. I, I, I'm not so sure about it and things like that. It was specific, uh, specifically mentioned that don't do that. And we know that when we repent, we receive forgiveness, but there will still be consequences. I cannot say, I go and murder somebody, God forgive me, and after that, I'm scot-free. No way. There are consequences to all of our actions. And we know that the wages of sin is death. And in today's situation, death is actually to be separated from the Lord. Right? So we need to take note of that. The wages of sin is death. And those who have not known Jesus will be separated for eternity. We thank God that there's always a way out for us, that we can ask God for forgiveness. First John chapter 1, verse 9, it says that if you confess your sin, God is always ever ready to forgive us from all unrighteousness. And we thank God for that, that we approach the table each time as we partake of the Holy Communion. We search ourselves. We allow the Holy Spirit to come and to shine His light of truth into those areas of our lives so that we can surface all those things and to ask God for forgiveness. And the fourth thing is scary. Sin will find us out. We can run but we cannot hide. That one day, this will come knocking at our doors. Why is it so drastic? Because sin is serious. Serious. How do we know it's so serious? How serious is this? It's so serious that it has to cost the life of God to die on a cross. Do you think that's serious? Of course it's serious. The life of God, that He has to offer Himself to pay for the price of sin. I mean, just ask this theologically. Okay, it's a theological question. Can God forgive me of my sin? It's not a trick question. Can God forgive me of my sin? May I say to you, the answer is No. Because every sin requires a punishment, a penalty. You need to find a, pro, uh, a substitute to die on our behalf. I was supposed to die to receive eternal damnation, to be separated from God for eternity, forever and ever and ever and ever. But yet, because of the loving kindness of God, because of His grace and mercy, because of who He is, He has to pay the price for you and for me. He paid the price that He did not owe, the, the debt that He did not owe. 
and I owe the debt that I cannot pay. And Jesus has to die on the cross. And because of his death on the cross, and therefore now I receive him as my Lord and Savior, then my sins can be forgiven. So we need to understand that. That sin is serious. It's not something that is that we want to have fun with and, and things like that. So what then is the strategy of success? One is sanctify and set yourself apart. We've covered that on circumcision. The second thing is to seek out and size up. We see in chapter 5, verse 13, Joshua actually went in and encountered this person. Chapter 5, verse 13, it says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or our adversaries? And he said, No, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Immediately you see, and Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your foot, for the place you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. Another place that we see someone removing their sandals is actually when Abraham, uh, sorry, when, when Moses was uh, at the burning bush, and the Lord told him, Remove your sandals, for the place you're standing is holy. And we know that servants don't wear sandals. But in the prodigal son's story, that when he came back, the Lord puts, the father puts sandals on his feet to recognize him as the accepted son of the Lord. And so we need to seek out and to size up, like I've said, different levels, different devils. We need to understand what kind of strategy that has to be employed. Whether it's going to be the, the way, I mean, God is going to show God is going to instruct, God is going to say to the, like the King Jehoshaphat, just go in, send your worshippers and sing and worship and dance and give thanks to the Lord for His good, for His love endures forever. And the Lord will begin to do the battle on their behalf and to set ambushes to all the camps of the enemy. And we praise God for that. God is going to give very clear and specific instructions as to how we can overcome. But the important thing is to see the Savior, our commander. He's the Lord Sabaoth, the commander the Lord of hosts, right? In other words, He has behind Him the myriads and myriads of angels. The Bible tells us only one-third of the stars fell, was swept away, and it represents the the fall of Satan together with one-third of the angels. If one-third has fallen, how many are left? Sorry, no price for this, okay? Two-thirds. Is two-thirds more than one-third? Of course. So each time when we're encountering powers of darkness, there'll be at least two other angels helping you. So praise God. Relax. My penrai. Follow Ajahn Thomas. My penrai. Oh, I just love that. I mean, it sounds so chill, you know. So relax. You've got to be cool and know that God is with us. Greater is He who is in you than he that is in the world. And we just want to thank God for that. So we want to see the commander. And when he asks, uh, uh, by the way, are you for us or are you for the adversaries? If he says yes, what does it mean? It means to say that I'm calling the shots. I'm the boss. And sometimes we read Psalm 23 as the Lord is my shepherd. I will instruct him as to what to do. Hey, uh, send me to this place to get grass. Send me to the place to get uh, quiet waters. You are my shepherd, you know, you listen to me. But God forbid, God is the shepherd that He guides us, He leads us. And so we know that He says, neither. In other words, I'm the one calling the shots, I'm the commander, not you. You are the one who's going to listen. And therefore, immediately, Joshua responded by saying, Lord, you are the Lord God Almighty. And this is not an angel because when we see in the Bible, whenever people worship the angel, the angel says, hey, come on, relax. I'm just like a servant like you. Get up. Don't worship me. But when he fell in worship before this person, we know that he is God himself, that God receives the worship from mankind. So we know that from this, 
the first thing is that there is this confidence in the Lord. In chapter 6, verse 2, it says, See, I have given you Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty man of valor. So we need to understand that God wants to give us the assurance and the confidence that whatever that we do, the Lord is with us, that we just behold and to see that God has given us the victory. We need to see from the way God sees. You see, the unfortunate thing is many a times we are not able to see what God is showing us. And when we're not able to see that, then we are able, we are, we are just short-sighted. We're not able to see the victory that's right there. And then he gave a very clear and specific command. He says, march round the city. Seven priests with seven shofars. So as you march round, shofar, show good. And so anyway, so the seven shofars, and of course seven is a very specific number. Priests, of course, again, we talk about prayer. That you march round the city and with the seven shofars. And shofars are used, I believe all of us understand this teaching because this is the culture of this church. Before the service, you have the sound of a shofar. It's a call to attention. It's to call to war. It's a proclamation of freedom. We see this in Leviticus chapter 25. It's also to warn, you know, as we are watchmen of the wall, we blow the trumpets, we blow the shofar. And of course, this shofar is actually ram's horns and not, not uh, bull's horn because uh, bull reminds them of the golden calf in which they worship. And so we know that this is something that is specific to all of them. Be silent. Don't say a word. Sometimes God tells us to shut up. Can you just shut up? I mean, so difficult, right? Not to talk. We always want to talk, you know. So every time we come together, we have, you know, this, that, this, that, and all kinds of... Nowadays, I can say I tell grandfather stories because I'm grandfather. So I tell grandfather stories. I mean, there's so many grandfather stories to tell. And so the Lord is saying, shut up. You know why? Because there was so much murmuring and complaining when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. And the Lord is saying to all of us that we need to keep our mouths tight because there's power in our tongue, the power of life and death. Zechariah was told to shut up. In fact, not told. He was made to shut up because he cannot talk until the son was being born and he called his name John. And so, Sometimes God is saying, because sometimes negative words can just come out from our I mean, I can imagine myself if I'm one of them marching around, hey, why are we doing this? Come on, waste of time, you know, what stupid strategy, you know, and, and stuff like that. And I mean, it doesn't make sense, you know, walking around and then keep quiet and then people blowing the shofar and, and with the ark uh, carrying so heavy, the ark, you know, be complaining and complaining and complaining. But the Lord says, keep quiet. And on the seventh day, seven rounds and give a shout! Shout unto God with a voice of triumph that we celebrate the Lord. You know, each time as we shout, it's a shout of proclamation. You know, sometimes I don't understand, you know, people say, you know, in church, got to keep quiet and everything. But in the football match, oh, they shout out. And the worst thing is they don't even know any single one of them. They don't even know, they don't even have a personal relationship with Ronaldo or you know, uh, whosoever, you know, and we don't even know them. And we shout, ah, go! I just love the Spanish commentators. Oh, go! <laughs> Those Liga football. So anyway, uh, that's not divert. So, so, and we know the Lord, and we want to shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. We just want to celebrate the goodness of the Lord. We just want to give Him all the praise and all the glory. But today I don't feel like, hey, Pastor, I come to church, uh, I just quarrel with my wife, and then, you know, traffic jam, and then my dog bark at me, and stuff like that. So, uh, let's put all this aside. There's nothing to do with the worship of God. I tell you, the moment you start engaging and coming to the presence of God, I tell you, things will begin to change. Right? So, there are very clear, specific instructions, and then also we know the presence, the prayer and the presence and proclamation of uh, the declaration of victory. We just want to worship and shout to the Lord. No idle talk. So what are the strongholds that we're facing today? There are three areas, I believe all of us understand. The body, the soul, and the spirit. Of course, when we talk about the body, it's the flesh. The people suffer from 
infirmities, all kinds of sickness, and all kinds of diseases. And the soul, we talks about the mind. The soul consists of the mind, the will, the emotions. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5. The strongholds in the mind that exalts itself against the knowledge of the Lord. And we know that many a times that all these are being attacked. Like for example, like in the soul, when a person is angry, a person becomes so angry that it becomes rage. I think that's something that we really need to deal with. And what is really the root cause of anger? The root cause of anger is actually a sense of fear. And we just respond and react like that, you know, become so kanchong, you know, we we have this, we suffer from kanchong ration. So we get so kanchong and we we get so worried that it's not going to happen, you know, everything is out of control. We get so fearful and we, we get so angry. Why is it not happening this? You know, it should be this, 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 and why is it not like that, you know? And so we get into all kinds of mess. Behind all these are deep seated emotional needs. And many a times it leads to sickness. Right? So, where a spirit, there are things like a wounded spirit, there are spirit that is damaged because of uh, abuse and things that we go through, even as our, our children, as, as, a, as a child, we go up, grow up with all these being, you know, uh, spoken over us. You know, when I was a little kid, I started off being, being told as I'm a Fei Tai, you know, Fei Tai, Fei Tai, Fei Tai, Fei Tai, until Fei Lo, you know. So, graduate, you know, Fei Lo already. So, anyway. So I got to renounce that and reject that and to say, Lord, I have to stop all these and stop believing in all these lies in which the enemy is putting into me and in the name of Jesus. And of course, we overcome by prayer, by fasting, and the armor of God. And in Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, it says, these things don't come up by, only by prayer and fasting, right? So the way to to so-called kill our flesh. The best way, I feel, is through fasting. Because what's really stopping me from going downstairs to eat a nice bowl of fishball noodles? It's the will. I have to die to self. I've got to surrender to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to eat this because I want to subject this will and to surrender it to the Lord. And I can tell you this will really help us in terms of putting to death our flesh. And of course, prayer is something that is important because it is actually a gesture of humility. We are seeking the heart and the mind of God, the wisdom and strategies that we come before the Lord in total yieldedness and to ask the Lord for direction. And of course, the armor of God. Just now, Elder Jun Lai was talking about the armor of God. Our backs are not covered. Right? So we need to know that we are always advancing. There's no retreat. We need to have the helmet of salvation. And what does the helmet do? It protects our head, right? Our minds. And sometimes we knock, kong. <laughs> I just like the Chinese word, kong. Kong. Oh, some, there's nothing in between the ears. So anyway, we need to understand that the mind is so important. There's a place where the devil plays his tricks. That's the battlefield in which the enemy attacks us, the mind. And we have all kinds of different attacks from the, from the enemy. And to say, you know, God has forgotten you. God is not concerned. God doesn't love you. You see, la, you know, and all kinds of accusations and everything. Of course, we have the breastplate of righteousness. And the breastplate of righteousness protects our, our heart. We need to be protected. The enemy always hit at us. And of course, we just want to the belt of truth, the gospel shoes of peace, We will the the sword of the Spirit and the shield of faith, which is able to quench every fiery dart. The enemy always wants to attack all of us because that's his mission statement. And what's the mission statement of the enemy? He's come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he always hit below the belt. He says, hey, that's not fair. That's exactly because he's the devil. Since when he's fair? He's always attacking the saints of the Lord. So we need all kinds of weapons. Of course, there are other ways to overcome. We have the ministry of angels, we have the blood of the Lamb, and uh, you have uh, praise and worship and and different things. And really, I'd like to put this across to all of us. They overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. 
But many a times we forgot the fine print. And they did not love their lives to the death. If we are able to come to the place where if my life is taken, so be it, I tell you, you live a life of freedom. The reason why we are not able to do that because we just want to, I mean, this is human nature, self-preservation. But if we say to the Lord, Lord, if I need to go, not because of some foolish things, you know, like uh, trying to test God, you know, and jump off the building and say, Lord, I am full of faith. I mean, I feel sorry for you. So, I mean, we need to understand that we need to come to a place where we not love our lives even unto death. And therefore, by doing that, we are able to overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I'd like to close with a story, a grandfather's story. It's about my father. The Jericho Wall that I was facing. I believe all of us face different Jericho Walls. One time, he was admitted to hospital. My late father, he has passed on already. He was admitted to hospital because of a heart issue. He's got a leaking valve. And I don't know why hospitals like to call you at midnight. They call me at midnight and says, you know, are you so-and-so? You know, your father is so-and-so. I say, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, your father is not doing well. I think it's important for you to just come down and see him. So when you hear news like this, is this big, huge, thick wall. I haven't got time to talk about the thickness of the wall. It can actually sit two horse carriages as how thick it is the wall of Jericho. And so when I heard that, I tell you, I was so troubled because I know that the doctors are saying time is up. And so I drove down, I sped down, and I went quickly, and I was praying and praying and interceding and interceding and asked the Lord to, to be merciful, to extend His life. And the moment when I stopped praying, instead of praying, I started worshipping and praising God. And thanking God, I know that was a point of breakthrough. You see, we begin to understand intercession as that. Then we begin to pray and pray and pray. All of a sudden, the Lord says, no, just worship. I begin to worship and thank God. I know that's the time of breakthrough. And to cut the long story short, the Lord extended His life and spared Him from danger that evening. What are the Jerichos you are facing in your life? The Lord wants to come alongside you, to empower you. And the Lord is just waiting for you to call upon Him and to say to Him, Lord, come. Come and help me, Lord. Help me, O God. Intervene in my situation. If I have got to walk around this, you know, just by keeping silent, but waiting upon you, Lord, show me your strategies. Show me your direction. Show me what to do. And I'll gladly do it. And you walk with a sense of obedience and trust. It takes a lot of faith Imagine walking around Jericho walls and, and just keeping silent. What kind of strategy is that? It requires so much faith and obedience and trust and discipline and to say, Lord, I truly want to put myself into your hands and to believe. And you see the walls of Jericho crashing down. Amen? Amen. Shall we all stand as we close in prayer? Father, we just want to thank you that, Lord, there is uh, always a way of escape, Lord. There's always a way in which you will instruct us, a way in which you will direct us, a way in which you will help us out of our Jericho situations. And sometimes it's not going around it, but we've got to see these walls crashing down, that you open up a way to take all the spoils for your glory. And we just want to thank you, O oh God, that you are such a loving God. We just want to give you praise, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you continue to bless each one of us. I pray that whatever needs that we have, we just surrender it to you. Thank you, Lord. Those of us who need someone to pray with you and say, Lord, help me to bring the Jericho wall down. Just raise your hand. I'd like to pray especially for you. God bless 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 you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you, Lord, for these hands are being raised to you, Lord. And Father, we know that you not only see our hands, but you see our hearts. You, need, you see our needs. You see our situation. You see the challenges. You see the walls, the thick walls of Jericho in our lives, Lord. Lord, you feel the pain, oh God, for these people. 
you feel the pain for these people, O oh God. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that these walls will come crashing down as we call upon your name. Because, Lord, we know that with you all things are possible. I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you continue to bless every single one. Intervene. Show us your strategies, Lord. Guide us, Lord. Lead us, Lord. Direct us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you bless each and every single one who has raised their hands to you. Lord, we just ask that you intervene in your own special way. We give you all the praise. Give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.